You know, we still need the stories, whether we read modern novels or not. It's like, you know, we need that connection, whether it's with our elders or with our kids. You know, we pass these stories on as something precious. For me personally, it's probably just the, the unknown, you know. I've, I've always been drawn more to the unknown and whatever the beyond of, of, normal, of normal life. So I would actually go out and look for these. You know, we would go to haunted houses, we would go to haunted areas of the cities, <laughs> see what was going on, you know. Yeah, now, whatever that comes from, I don't know, but it, but it kept life interesting. It was almost like an escape. Definitely an escape. Family life was not a happy life. So that was an escape, all, definitely. <laughs> Welcome to the Floaties for Krakens podcast. I am your host, Camille Maria Costa, and it is a brilliant day to be monstrous. Hi, cuttlefish. Welcome back to season three, episode two of the Floaties for Krakens podcast. Hi, how's it going? How's everybody's almost fall? It's basically fall right? I mean, happy Halloween. Um, I think we can finally say that. <laughs> Does anybody else get super pumped for the Halloween holiday? Um, I'm sure everybody who listens to the show does. Um, how soon does everybody start decorating for Halloween? I'm very curious because I think I'm about to start um, next week. <laughs> because come on, are you kidding? I mean, granted, right? Like this is uh, my ofrenda for Dia de los Muertos, but um, spooky, right? And she's up year round. So come on, right? Let's, let's do it. Let's start decorating. Um, oh my gosh. I'm also really excited. Has anybody been thinking about what they want to be for Halloween yet? If you, if you do drop them down in the comments below, I want to know. I love learning about people's costumes. I love when people have multiple costumes for multiple events, even more exhilarating. Gosh, I love Halloween. What a fun, fun holiday. Anyway, hi. I hope you're well. I hope the weather's treating you kindly at least a little bit more as the days go on. I hope you're drinking water and eating a good snack because that's important. But anyway, welcome to this episode, season three, episode two. It's an incredible one. And this one has been in the making for quite some time now. Um, so you'll hear a lot of references in this episode to spring and May and things like that. Um, and, and bless her heart, uh, this individual, not only Akash, this individual is so incredible, brilliant, kind, just like the sweetest person I've ever met and so passionate about the work that she does. And the way that she writes is incredible. The way that she thinks is so selfless and so just powerful and I'm, I'm so thrilled for you all to hear about her. She actually graced us with her beautiful presence um, during our Kindness for Krakens raffle so you got a little sneak peek at what she does and who she is but in case you don't know we have the incredible incredible Lauren Rocha with us. Lauren uh, is just a stunning, stunning horror scholar. She's actually the professor of practice at Merrimack College in English. And her amazing book, The Sinful Maternal Motherhood and Possession Films is out. It is released. It is a lovely book. It is powerful. It's intense. It's something that everybody should be talking about in the horror community. So please go get it. I will link all of that stuff down below. Um, She's lovely. She's just an incredible, you're gonna see it. Uh, she's just so kind and cares so much about about the world of horror, but more so for visibility and for accessibility. And it's, it's, it's incredible. What she does is incredible. And I'm so thankful and lucky now to call her my friend. 
Um, also, just so you all know, a couple of trigger warnings. This episode is a bit complicated. We talk about um, PTSD, anxiety, depression, abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse. Um, we also talk about possession, right, and birthing and things of that nature. So it's an intense one. So do what you need to do um, uh, to protect yourself and keep yourself safe. But yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm really, really excited for you all to listen to this. It's, it's an incredible, incredible episode. Um, oh, also, I should probably let you all know, um, right in the middle <laughs> of this episode, Camille um, had to blow her nose. And so she decided to mute um, and pause the interview, but never actually pressed re-record afterwards. So there's a little bit of a chunk missing in the middle. Um, so you're probably like, what, are you serious? Are you kidding me? Um, yeah, I'm not that smart when it comes to technology. Just know that the part that you missed was just me talking about my thesis in the world of La Llorona, which I've talked about a little bit in other episodes. Um, I definitely talk about it um, with uh, Dr. Bernadette Kalafel's episode in season two. So in case you want to know about that, you can, but it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't change the course of the episode or anything. Um, I just thought I'd let you know that I made a mistake. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, but you, you didn't really miss much. Um, and Lauren was just about to start talking about research and the explorations of monstrosity and how important it is for visibility so yeah just so you know um but anyway buckle in i'm so excited for you all to listen to this incredible episode um from a brilliant mind so ladies and cuttlefish let me introduce to you daily affirmations for monsters in your mind well hi lauren <laughs> Hello. How are you again? <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me today. How are you doing? Uh, of course, first of all, we're so like beyond thrilled, I'm not kidding, to talk to you and to see the beautiful monsters in your mind and quite literally, right? And to, you know, hear about your journey. So we're so happy to have you and I'm fine. Um, it's spring, which is fantastic, but my allergies um, <laughs> don't like it yep. at all. So forgive me if I sniffle a little bit today, but um, other than that, we're good. Oh, we're perfectly good. understandable. What's the weather like over there? Um, so today in New Hampshire, it's kind of cool and a bit gloomy, but that's okay because I hate like the hot weather. So yeah. I will take this weather any day. Oh, heck yeah. I love that. Me too. I'm, I'm such a sucker for like a rainy day, something. I don't know. I, maybe it just adds to the spookiness, but <laughs> exactly. <I love> it. <laughs> well, for people that may not know, Lauren, who are you? What do you do? What do you like to do? What are your passions and what are your interests? Oh, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Rocha. I am an associate professor of practice in the English department at Merrimack College in North Andover, Massachusetts. In terms of professional interests, I'm interested in horror, gender, um, popular culture, and also in particular, in particular motherhood. My current research focuses on depictions of survival and abuse um, of women in 21st century horror. Per on the personal front, I live in New Hampshire with my husband and four cats, um, and I love to bake. I love to cook. Um, and I also, too, I love horror movies, but that kind of goes both personal and professional. Um, and I, in terms of personal, um, yeah, I horror takes up much of the personality and the love of cats. So I feel <laughs> like I've got it covered there. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Well, I, b before we go and dive into your your love and passions for horror, I think everybody wants to know what are the names of your four cats? Oh, <laughs> that's important. <laughs> absolutely. Um, in order of age from el from oldest to youngest, uh, there's Ginger, who is who was originally my cat. Um, okay. He he's a little gentleman. He's very sweet. There's yeah. Kit Cat who is who was my husband's cat she's definitely our spiciest kitty um 
she she is she's my little princess um and then we adopted two kittens two years ago um and there's twinkie who oh. is an orange cat she's very mischievous but also adorable yes and then there's herbie who um we believe has the spirit of a dog but in cat form what an amazing circus of kitties. That sounds so fun. <laughs> this is the perfect word for them. <laughs> I really, I really do hope that they make an appearance. If not, that's okay. We'll just bring you back so that they can make an appearance. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. They, they do. They love to make appearances usually when I'm on. And um, usually most people who have had like Zoom meetings or anything else with me, um, they've seen like a cat tail or them in my office. Kit Kat likes to come up and like just be on my shoulder. And um, yeah, so that that's always fun to, you know, hold a serious conversation while the cat's just right there. I love it. I love it so much. That's so spectacular. That's so great. Ah, well, okay, okay, okay. So many things, so many things, especially after you brilliantly stated what you do and what your interests are i'm really curious lauren like what kind of sparked your interest for the world of the spooky or how did it find you how did you find it um so again i think there there's kind of um the personal and professional divide um yeah. because before going to my undergrad institution um i didn't think you could like you could write on horror, you could write on popular culture. Um, I thought any, the closest thing to that would be writing on the Gothic. Um, and so while I was there, the English department offered English ghost story as a seminar course, um, which was really fantastic. And I, and I took that. And then I also too was in the honors program. So I had to write an honors thesis before I graduated. And I just remember sitting in my mentor's office, just going through things I'm interested in. And I was kind of on the fence and I said, well, I really like ghosts and I really like spooky things. And he said, do you know Twilight? And I was very much a fan of Twilight at the time in the books. Like I was obsessed like i i think i still have probably at my parents house like a team edward shirt and even my mom got into the books and she doesn't like to read like it was just so i was so excited and that process taught me that if you're a fan of something you should take caution if you're going to write on it professionally because you're going to be forced to criticize it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I remember I would like point out things and my friends would get very defensive about the books sure. um, and, and about like Edward and Jacob and sure, sure. Um, and then when I went to graduate school, in order to write my master's thesis, I had to choose a topic. And although they didn't really offer much in the popular culture department, they did have an early, early American professor that I took. And so I wrote on early New England witchcraft and mm -hmm. it was, it was a real joy and got to look at the actual like books and other materials. And it was, it was a great experience. Um, I could tie in my love of Salem into it. Yeah. And, yeah. and then I was able to use part of that in terms of writing the sinful maternal motherhood and possession films on the chapter on the witch, um, because they, they, that film draws from so much historically. Yeah. And, and personally, um, my love of all things spooky and horror and monsters started at a very young age. Um, I loved the Goosebumps series. Um, I loved Are You Afraid of the Dark? I was that, I was that kid standing, like reading like scary stories to tell in the dark. Like I, I just, I really liked it. And um, my sister is five years older than me. Um, so I was able to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer before <laughs> probably appropriate for my age it's fine um, it's fine <laughs> yeah i remember watching like 
the X Files and Roswell. Like I, I just loved that and Mystery Science Theater three thousand. Oh I thought my it was gosh. hilarious! And God. I think for me, I, I was kind of an outsider as a kid. I was very much bullied for my size and my weight, um, and so there was that sense of knowing. I think internally, even before I became really conscious of it that I am an outsider. And so here are these narratives where these kind of typical outsiders are suddenly like, like they're accepted or they, they force others to pay attention to them. Hmm. Well, first of all, excuse me, but screw those people. Um, that's so stupid. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Thank you. That's not okay. Um, at all and they're just I don't know I hope they're <laughs> in a better place I hope they're you know taking accountability but all that aside I relate to you so deeply on that front and I think as you mentioned right earlier when you were talking about Twilight right and how fans and friends right get so defensive defending this stuff and it makes complete sense I think we at such a young age or at such vulnerable parts of our lives become so deeply entwined with these narratives and with these characters and with these monsters, right? They, they become these superheroes for us. They, they fight the good fight and we see ourselves right represented in, in the things that they do They're As you mentioned, they're powerful. They're in control. They're in charge, right? They're the ones that are making it out at the end of, at the end of it. And, it, it makes sense. It, it makes so much sense um, that your friends defended it, right? And and um, as as a fellow team Edward Gurley, um, <laughs> and who has also had to dissect later in life um, Twilight and some of the complexities of the narrative in the story, right? Like it's just natural, you know. There there are so many different layers to stories, but I I love it. I love. I, I don't love that bad things had to happen to you in order for you to find monsters. That's stupid. And I wish it never did happen that way. But I, nonetheless, I am so happy that that monsters found you in Ooh. that way and that they stuck with you all the way, you know, like throughout, like you said, seeing your personal and your professional life and they could mix together and you could continue writing. I think that is so freaking cool. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think I'm also fortunate too, in terms of just like even my personal timeline that like growing up in the nineties and even in the, the first half of the two thousands um, to like monsters was still kind of, I think viewed in mainstream culture as, as somewhat of an outlier. Um, but then when you start to get true blood and especially the twilight series yes. and film version, plus the books, um, it it became much more acceptable to to like monsters because they're becoming more sexy and oh, more yeah. humanized um and even too then there was the vampire diaries and then um the originals nice. and so just this whole slew of just like again continuing that theme of pretty attractive people engaging with pretty attractive monsters that's so true. I mean, it's and it's crazy, right? It's crazy to see how that hype grew and how being popular suddenly became synonymous with like liking those things, right? Like those were popular kids liked those things and the cool kids and the people that everybody focused on and paid attention to, right? And I think that is so wild that that is a real wild thing. Um, yeah. And I think it's also interesting to see how it like grew from goosebumps, right? Like, are you afraid of the dark? Scary, tor scary stories to tell in the dark, all the way to like vampire diaries. And like, I don't know, it's just so interesting. And also that idea of romanticizing, right? And romanticism and, and, and sexiness and all of that stuff. It monsters are crazy. They are complicated, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they they are and I and I do think in terms of even like you turn to possession films one of I think the 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 fear that it 
these films convey um, is that even to the physical body will deteriorate so rapidly and and also to just change so much that the person's almost unrecognizable I think that's one of the fears when it comes to also to like possession films um, Mm. currently Um, and then also to the idea of like the self changing Um, because with vampires even though they have that vampiric control um, the person is still them at some point and Mm. the the vampire um, they can in a sense possess the mind however they can also they're also at least contemporary um, portrayed as again the the sexy handsome or beautiful vampire. Ah, oh, I love it. I love it. It's so, so great. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. So before, before we get into, you, you mentioned your book, which I'm definitely going to ask you about, but before we get into that, how would you define first, first demons maybe, right? Like, I guess we'll go in order. How would you define the concept of demons, demonology, th- things like that? So with demons and demonology, um, I think that it's a study of really specific, almost individual, um, because a lot of times demons tend to have names given to them. They have specific associations. um, And so I think that they are a bit more distinguished as like an individual foe um, Mm -hmm. and a malevolent force. Whereas I think like devils, which tends to get used almost interchangeably, I think to be possessed by the devil or a devil, it's just this more vague, I think, malevolent force that's possessing Mm -hmm. um, very they might have a name associated with them, but usually if it's a demon, um, there are even two specific characteristics. Um, so for example, in the conjuring two, uh, um, you have that the demon Valak, um, who is, I, I believe one of the titles is the Marquis of snakes. Oh um, my so, gosh. And even to where like in the exorcism of that demon, um, it gets more specific with the details. Um, they usually have to find out the demon's name. They have to, in order to expel it. Um, and I think with demonology, I think it's the study of how these demons have been represented um, across both religious texts, but also to, I would I would venture to say also popular culture as well. Um, yes. There are specific characteristics, their sightings, um, and also to exorcisms that can be performed I guess I never really thought about it that way you're absolutely right and I don't know giving giving a character of any kind you know in any story in any narrative in any movie what have you (laughs) more characteristics and more almost human qualities right like this idea of we're beginning to know this thing a, a lot we're getting a lot of reference points where we're really understanding this 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 creature, right? And that's frightening. Um, that that's so terrifying. Like, I don't know, there there you're right. There is something about in movies and films like The Conjuring, right? Where the exorcist, right? Like the the one of the most popular <laughs> right uh, movies uh, involving the idea of uh, demons, right? Like just that I don't know, like there's something about a demon devils are scary too of course but like there's something about a demon and how how much we could relate I guess you could say um that that is terrifying (laughs) so scary yeah absolutely and I think similar along those lines um ghosts also too tend to be much more specific and individual so in the first Conjuring movie for example there's Bathsheba um Mm -hmm. and how she takes over um and so it's it's expelling her out which ultimately it is it is Lorraine who is able to do that um by calling on that fellow maternal agency and and I think ghosts present also to that kind of individual um challenge whereas again like the devil or even I I would say even to like like vampires even though they're individual um they're kind of more in that general possession category yeah yeah uh and 
And I have a question for you too. Yeah. I think picking your brain about this stuff. I'm sure you've seen the Insidious movies, yes? Oh, yes. Love. Love them. I think they're so scary and so good. And I think there's also, like, I think relating to, you, I think you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. In that Conjuring movie, when she falls to the basement and everything starts happening at the same time and it's very scary and there's a lot of different hauntings happening kind of all at once. Insidious gives off that same vibe, right? Of like mm -hmm. all of these both spirits and demons kind of intertwining and intersecting into these humans' lives. And whenever I think of demons, right, my brain goes to the further um, in Insidious, right? For for people that may have not seen the movies, I, I don't think this is a spoiler, uh, <laughs> but there's just a land um, that they call the further, right? Which at first, if and correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren, but um, there's a character that accidentally uh, astral projects kind of but then you find out it might be something else um but in this like world where where this character exists um a bunch of other um i don't think they're it's a mixture right lauren it's a mixture of demons maybe and spirits and ghosts i, I think i think so because also too in the in the in the insidious series at times um um, certain protagonists and, and the quote good characters will pass away, but they will appear in the further as well. Right. Um, right. So right. it is a sense that um, essentially it's, it's this kind of other world, but it's this other world that's always around us. Yes. And, and I think that's what makes those, that's what makes it so terrifying that, um, oh no, it always exists except certain people can see or venture into it and others just go about their lives surrounded by these spirits. It's, it's so wild. It's so wild. It's, it's almost like this idea of a upside down world, right? Like a, a bizarro world. Um, it, it, it's frightening. It's really frightening to think about. Um, but so cool. I don't know. I, I really, I really enjoy that concept. And I also think it's crazy too, at least in the insidious films, right? There are mediums, there are people that see them all the time, um, <laughs> which is even more terrifying, you know, to try to live in both of those worlds, I guess you could say. Yeah, it gives kind of a nod to The Shining where, yeah. um, again, like the ghosts, the spirits are always there, except certain people just always see them and, yeah. and are seen in return, which is also too terrifying. Um, and I think with Insidious, too, I... I I agree that like it's that upside down kind of it's that uncanny feeling it's the familiar yes. but it's not and yes. and certainly also too with those films what I find really interesting is the idea of repressing memory and how it, it's a terrible idea to begin with but then like mm. it, you see the repercussions of trying to do that and then those memories emerging later in life um and being and not knowing what to do with that. And also in the first one, um, just the mother's fear of not knowing what's wrong with your child and then like not knowing how to help your child. Right. Like that, that's also too quite terrifying. Gosh, it's, it's horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying. Those characters, oh, those characters are so great. I really enjoy, I, I really enjoy Insidious. <laughs> I really do. It, it's a fun time. I I really yes. I I also do. I really like Insidious. I like The Conjuring. I like like the haunted house movies. I guess you could say. Me too. Yes. <gasps> okay, we're about to fangirl. I'm going to ask you more questions because and this relates. I promise. Oh no! But, it um, does. Did you see The Haunting of Hill House? Yes, the Netflix series. Yes. I loved that. I loved how they adapted the book, how they adapted, like, I loved all the details. Um, I oh. thought it was just so well done. And to go through, like, the different grieving processes and also to then with mental health, like, just so many themes and even to family. Um, absolutely loved, loved that. I'm, I'm a major fan of Mike Flanagan. So yeah, um, I, but yeah, that was the first one I really fell in love with. 
Okay, okay. Before we really, because I want to ask you questions about this too. But before I ask you this question, I want to jump back to two other questions that I have. For people that also may not know, um, Lauren, what is a possession? I know we've been throwing around that kind of term. Uh, exorcism as well, right? Or expelling, right? So, so what is a possession, especially right with this idea of demon? Yeah, so and I would define a possession as really this outside force, usually supernatural, um, taking hold of a person, whether it's their mind, um, mind and body, whatever it can be. Um, and, and in terms of exorcism, I would I'd define it as an expelling in hopes of restoring that individual again. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes those exorcisms, the person claims not to have remembered after what they were doing. Other times um, they do remember. And in, in descriptions, usually the people will say it's, it's like knowing what's happening to them, but not being able to control mm-hmm. their body, which is, is very frightening on its own yeah it's so haunting literally (laughs) it it just is right like I I think I I don't know if I've ever truly met anybody who um, doesn't at least a little bit fear losing control right in some way um there there is a there's a frightening aspect to that um and I think what's even more scary I you you mentioned like this I uncanny valley earlier right that things are kind of similar but something's off and it's wild you'll see right in in narratives and books and stories and movies um and shows with possession and and demon possession (laughs) there's many characters that have been possessed for a long time and you have no idea and uh, Ah, like that's what's so scary, right? It it really is. And actually for a long time, I myself personally like avoided possession films because really? I was like, yeah, because I was like, I, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to think about it because it, yes. it was it was very much this fear of, like you said, losing control, having this other force control you um and i think one of my earliest memories of like knowing kind of what possession is um i'm gonna say goosebumps again and two episodes in particular um the mask which terrified me i still i'm claustrophobic anyways but i still refuse to put on a full face mask um and then yeah (laughs) like very scary this idea that like you would become this like external thing and it would shape your personality um and the night of the living dummy and like slappy scared me so much as a kid because like like what he wouldn't just like turn them into dummies like he would turn them into these 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 dummies these puppets that he also controlled and influenced and, uh. <laughs> yeah right? yeah oh and no when no, I watched no, no. like yeah when I watched the exorcist for the first time I was kind of nervous going into it and yes. and and then like I ended up I ended up finding it funny but that's my own dark humor <laughs> <laughs> that's okay it's it's what, what's crazy though too Lauren is that like I think it's also written to be a little funny yeah. right because, and I'm sure you can elaborate more on this, right? Like demons oftentimes are portrayed as the complete opposite of who you are, right? So ideally your character is good, right? You're the good guy um, in that way. And demons are representative of the complete opposite, right? They they want to to get at your throat. They want to make you feel horrible and terrible and in control, Um, in that way and there are some crazy things um crazy lines in that movie there is some very interesting stuff in that film um and you know obviously you know there are some silly things Uh, I think seeing it decades later um there's some silly things you see but it's funny how it's meant to play with you almost wouldn't you say I, I think that's a great way to put it um, because it's true of all horror. It, it is. It's trying to toy with you as an audience member. And and even too, I would agree with you. Like even um, I watched Exorcist Believer recently. I haven't seen it. I oh. So 
I thought it was better than I expected because I was aware okay. of the reviews. Um, right. Is it as good as the original Exorcist? No, but no, sure. no, sure. no remake of the Exorcist will. Um, sure. But I, I remember I was watching it and at one point I like said to myself like that, like these demons are, are so like, like teenage demons, like they were just <laughs> so like perfect because you have like the both parents of the girls like trying right. to get, trying their hardest and like the demons. Yeah. Like you said, they're just like playing with them and yeah. And just like, and to me, I think there was some humor in that as well. Um, and I, and I think in most horror films, like you said, you, you have those moments of humor, um, even because it does try to offset um, the darkness a bit. Yes. Yes. There's, there's levity, I think. And, you know, you mentioned hereditary, right? And I'm sure we're really going to get into that later, but um, I I actually saw it twice in the theaters. I don't know what not not to <laughs> be funny, but I don't know what possessed me to watch it twice because, wow, what an intense film! Um, but there are multiple people in certain parts yeah. that would break out in laughter, right? And I think, as you mentioned, there is also this sense too of like uncomfortability, and you don't know what to do yeah. um, with yourself. <laughs> so sometimes for many people laughing is just the first instinct yeah. right I'm uncomfortable I'm going to laugh that's it you know yeah and it's true <laughs> and like um even too with that film I I've watched it several times and even like the the scene where like he chooses to drive the sister to a hospital instead of calling like 911. And then what does he do? He leaves her like decapitated body in the back of his mom's car and then goes to sleep. And like, like, it's just, it is, it's that sense of like, what are they doing? But in yeah. that moment, they don't really know what to do. And, and I think for me, the, the humor in that film, like, or, or those moments of confusion just led to yes. my frustration with certain characters because, um, like, it, it, like why it just showed like such a detachment. Um, and, and even to, especially with, with the, with the characters who are men, the son and the father, like how their attitudes towards the women of, of both, um, Carly and then also to Annie and like the dinner yeah. table scene uh, was just so classic for me like like you know the fact that like she's really holding the son accountable and responsible and like his question back like well who pressured her to go to the party in the first place like yeah. it, it just oh it's so and the fact that the husband just stays there and just He's like doesn't so say stoic. anything yeah says nothing says yeah. nothing at all oh so ah <laughs> so so incredible so amazing, so hard to watch. Um, and I think, you know, I, I know we keep jumping around and I know we're going to talk about this more too, right? This concept of generational trauma and mental health. And I really want to get into how those can be forms of possession too. But before we get into that, you mentioned Sinful Maternal. So can you please, please explain to us, Lauren, what is that book? What is it about? And how did it come to be? Absolutely. Um, thank you. I I initially started it um, 2019. I had presented at a conference and I had been for a couple years really exploring these themes of um, the domestic, the self and horror. Um, and then so I started to, to think about that. And then I started to think about like the Babadook and issues of grief and motherhood. Nice. Um, and so I, I was very grateful. I was approached um, by a press, the University Press of Mississippi, um, yes. put together a book proposal. And so, you know, that's how the book really got started. Um, and so there was this little thing called the pandemic that happened. Oh, um, thing. <laughs> that's a thing. Huh. Uh, that threw everything off course. So writing it, um, I think I became a lot more introspective and really reflected on like how like 
as I'm writing this, how it's also too intertwined with my own personal life of suddenly having this, like creating my own family with my husband and our children. And do we want human children? Do we not want human children? And, um, we had many conversations around that. And, um, and it wasn't until we started looking at houses that we really had to answer that question of, do we, you know, do we want human children? Do we need a nursery? Do we, do we need those spaces? Um, and so for me, the, the book became quite personal in, in the process of writing on these horror films and, and in terms of what it's about, um, it's about different aspects of motherhood. And I think in writing it, I sought to answer the question, well, what is the sinful maternal? Um, and so I kind of tried to answer that through looking at different horror films that all prominently feature motherhood um, possess- in possession, whether motherhood of whether possession of the mother or possession of the child. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I looked at films like um, The Exorcist. I looked at also to Rosemary's Baby, the Amityville Horror, um, which that chapter, because that film, I understand, um, doesn't get much love, but that was really fascinating to write about single mothers and an income. Mm-hmm. And so that that was actually a really interesting chapter for me to, to, for me to pen. And then I also, too, look at films um, much more contemporary like the insidious and insidious chapter two and the conjuring Mm -hmm. the conjuring two um the babadook the witch um hereditary um so i i do i i look at these films and i look at and within each chapter i'm looking at these different facets so i'm looking at like motherhood as a means of exorcism and like the conjuring and the conjuring too um i'm looking at um like pregnancy and the maternal body and how people treat you how people can treat people who are pregnant um and then also too looking at um issues of of also too like not only single motherhood but also um grief and trauma and mental illness as well um looking at the historical treatment of women um, and also to then looking at how possession can also be empowering um, mm-hmm. and, and also to that generational trauma and that generational pressure or forced motherhood. Um, and so ultimately I, I, an- I conclude the book by answering the sinful maternal really is something that every woman embodies because it means going against these prescribed norms of not only motherhood, but also womanhood as well. And we're, we're damned if we try to conform and we're damned if we don't. Um, so there, it's really this state that we're always put in of, of both should try to be this way, but knowing you can't be as well. You know, it's funny to think too, that like, you don't think there's that right at first glance, maybe like, oh yeah, maybe there's one or two movies, just movies, right? About motherhood and, and, and possession or, or right. This idea of losing control and in the horror genre. And then you just named all of those just off the top of your head. And you're like, "Uh oh, (laughs) there's actually, it's a it's a trope that's been um, utilized and explored um, for a long time, yeah. <laughs> a, a whole a whole lot of time. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, why do you think, Lauren? Why do you think the world is so obsessed with seeing not only a, a woman or a female body um, possessed, but a mother right um, in that in that way? right in this idea of the other in this idea of I I, I'm forgetting what scholar coined the term of like the deviant femme right this idea that Mm -hmm. like oh you're not a good uh, woman if you do xyz you're not a Mm -hmm. a real woman or a real mother or what what have you right why do you think society is so obsessed with writing stories um like that I think because these stories um 
one way or another, they ultimately address um, these issues around surrounding women. Um, I think even too, like in the United States, like women weren't allowed to vote, but also they were viewed as property for a very long time too. Yes. And even even too, in terms of laws, um, I believe it wasn't until the 1970s a woman couldn't open a, a bank account on her own. And, and so I think like what these stories do is really try to explore those issues i think they center around the mother in particular because for a mother to be possessed the mother is traditionally considered the nucleus of the home and so to have something possess her all of a sudden the whole family is at risk um she is viewed as traditionally viewed as the child bearer and so suddenly the the children are at risk, but also too in tradition in that traditional model of the nuclear yeah. family, the husband's also at risk too. It's you know that's his wife oh, yeah. who is, who is possessed, and right. and there are certainly also too like these non traditional families where the mother does get possessed or there's possession involved. Um, but I think at the heart we do view mothers as these protective guiding figures. And so when they become possessed, suddenly that totally gets undermined and mothers are thrown into this state of chaos and the whole family is in chaos as well. It's wild. Yeah. It's wild to think about it that way. And you're absolutely right. Um, women, mothers in that way um, are, are, are the glue for many yeah. families. I'm not saying all, of course not, but like for many families, um, that is traditionally right. The, the silent glue, maybe they don't get all the praise they deserve. Um, a kind of roles right in, in, in these, in these families, in these nuclear families, as you mentioned, and seeing that break, um, and seeing that disappear, um, is so frightening for so many. Um, and it reminds me so much. So my uh, my thesis work um, in school was all about the legend of La Llorona, right? The oh, legend of the weeping yeah. woman, um, which, right? Everything you just said, yes, <laughs> yes, times two, yeah. right? The, the uh, you know, just cut and paste in Mexican format. That's all, right? This idea of this woman that loses it. Mm hmm and um, is no longer uh, a good woman, is no longer a good mother, right? And exploring those complexities. Um, and it's crazy. It's crazy to see, right, how, how much weight uh, mothers bear on their shoulders um, in that way, right? Uh, females in general. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild. It, it's wild to see that. Yeah, ab absolutely. I'm curious to know, like, with your thesis, um, what did you ultimately find? Oof. Almost, quote unquote, safe ways to discuss these larger issues. I think sometimes, too, not only monsters, but also, too, just these fictional narratives, um, they can become a way to help us access that. Oh, absolutely. Like, they people don't realize how necessary and important stories are yeah um people think for example even childhood stories right yeah. are silly or strange or untrue right um and and there's this negative connotation to this idea of childish um and again for people like us right for people like you and i for people that have seen really dark things per per perhaps in ourselves um and are scared right um they're everything they're they're the only way we've ever been able to talk about very t hard stuff right mm -hmm. like to begin to even break it down and research it and explore it right like it, horror just means so much um, monsters mean so much, right? Spooky stuff just means so much. And I think it just extra means that much when your brain is also a little <laughs> spooky too. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, golly. I don't know. I, I, I'm so excited. I, please, I, I hope it's okay with you, but I always ask the guests, right? Um, uh, if they can send me all of the links to all the things that they're doing and have done so we can drop them down in the description. But I'm so excited um, 
to, to, to read your work, especially like see it grow from like the explorations of, of, you know, the, this idea of motherhood, but also this idea of the witch and this idea mm-hmm. of history and cultural trauma. Like, ah, uh, yeah. you're speaking my language. Oh, thank, <laughs> Lord. You. thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we've been kind of dancing around it, um, but I'm really curious. I I was so in love when we were talking back and forth about what monster you were going to choose for this episode of the show. Um, and while you were like, yeah, we're going to talk, I, I would love to talk about demons, right? And possession and X, Y, Z, you, you kind of claimed them as this idea of monsters in the mind as well. Can you please elaborate on that? Because I, I find it very fascinating. Yeah, I think it's monsters in the mind, um, can take on a lot of different forms. Um, I think they can be again, that possession route of like the demons and the devils, but it can also be too, like I mentioned, like, like maybe someone or something controlling the mind and, and whether or not it's also too, like, um, it could be again, like that monster, that vampire control, or even to like a witch, taking control of a person's mind it can also too relate to mental health but also too to relationships um there are so many relationships and so many individuals who have had that where all of a sudden the person just seems to take over their life and they might become infatuated with them only to realize like how much they gave of of their own self in that process um Mm -hmm. so i think it's monsters of the mind um it's a very very definition it can mean like i said the fictional monsters it can also mean real life monster situations um but also too it can mean in terms of mental health things like ptsd anxiety depression um just so many other um circumstances and issues um it can also mean that and i i would dare to say like i think we all have monsters in our mind um whether or not we identify them as monsters or think of them as monsters um we all have um something that's in us um that we all struggle with beautifully said absolutely absolutely i mean and um, especially when maybe mental health isn't talked about uh, for you, maybe growing up. And don't get me wrong, things are changing so much. And I'm so excited for the future of the discourse around mental health and how important it is. But even still, right, uh, I, for one, can't afford therapy, right? Therapy yeah. is expensive or or medication or or just, right, talking about your mental health to someone is so hard and it's so scary. Um, and, and I love that you included this idea of people in your life sometimes, right? Like relationships um, can almost feel possessive, almost feel yeah. like you're losing yourself. Um, and, and that can be in a beautiful way. That can be in a hor- horrible way, mm-hmm. right? It can be taken from you, right? Like there are just so many different ways to look at monsters in the mind. And I also agree with you. I I very much agree with you that I think all of us have them. I think maybe there's different types. Maybe we all have different kinds. Maybe we only have just one that goes through a lot. (laughs) But I think we all do have something within us that, gosh, can be frightening. Yeah. Right? And it can be quite frightening to even to process um, what we've gone through. Um, yes. And even and even so um, with mental health, where May is Mental Health Awareness Month, too. I agree yes. with you that we've made so many strides in terms of better understanding and better um, destigmatizing mental health. But I do think also, too, there is still this stigma around mental health. Um, there's more awareness now, especially in schools and counselors, um, and also too, even within jobs, more training, which is wonderful because for me growing up, um, like depression was known, but it was still considered that like, oh, they're on Prozac, like, Mm 
right, and, right. and that person would become othered in that way. Um, and so it was quite difficult. Um, and then even too, for myself, I was only recently diagnosed with anxiety and depression and PTSD. And I look back to when I grew up and I will remember my mom coming home from like parent teacher conferences saying like, so-and-so is afraid that you are going to become so stressed out. You're going to have a stroke before you're 30. And yeah. I look back at that and I'm like, that's a clear signal. Like your child has anxiety. Right. Um, but I think because there was this lack of awareness and resources for parents, um, it, it was hard to identify that. Um, and, you know, on my own mental health journey, as I began to process past trauma, um, it did become extremely frightening for me um, because mm -hmm. in a way it's like once you once you open up that door to let those monsters in, um, it can be like a wave all of a sudden um, rather than this kind of gentle processing. Um, and it is, it is something that um, takes so much work. But like you point out, not everyone has the resources to do that work. Yeah. Well, I'm so proud of you, first of all, for Aww. sticking to that journey because that is so scary and so hard. And I'm so proud that you got a diagnosis. I feel like that is, I mean, it, it sure, it brings its own battles, right? Um, that It's complicated. It's like, oh my God, the monster has a name, right? <laughs> like you could think about it that way. But you can also think about it like, oh my God, the monster has a name, right? Like the the monster has a name and, and is me and um, can be dealt with like, like me, like a person um, and can be explored and can be nourished right and i i don't know it's it's so complicated depression is so complex on its own anxiety is so complex ptsd is so complex mm -hmm. right and having a spicy little cocktail right of of three is is hard it, it's I, so hard yeah i agree and and thank you also too it's for me when i was diagnosed it was actually more of a relief because i can now it was like validation like yeah. no 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 i have something yes. and and so it was more of a relief of that and you're absolutely right like it, it can be like you know overwhelming and then just like coming to a place where you just treat treat it as this is who i am and this just means you know, this means I'm going through like a, a time when I'm depressed or anxious yes, yes. or my PTSD is bad. And how do I take care of myself in those moments? It's so too, I think, empowering for little you, right? For little Lauren of being so lost probably in those moments and not understanding why I do feel like I'm going to have a stroke right now over something that for some reason, nobody else seems to be stressing yeah. about or outwardly anyway, talking about. And I, I love to think that these moments of working on ourselves to try to just figure out what's going on, just to understand, because we're never going to fully understand ourselves. We're so strange and weird and <laughs> got so much going on, but like, those little victories are so impactful and so powerful for, for little Lauren, for other little Laurens, right? For other, for I'm sure your students, right? And even if that's like you not, you know, disclosing it all the time, which is your right. right as a human, but I think people seeing you um, explore these things and, and learn about yourself um, is so brave. And that, and that trickles down. Right. People can see that and be like, oh, I, I could do that. I I can also kind of learn about my monsters in the mind, no matter how scary it might might seem. Right. Well, thank you. And I and thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and it, it's true again, like, you know, when I've talked before about the blending of personal and professional, like there used to I used to try to like compartmentalize them a lot more I can't do that anymore <laughs> yes. um, so I mean Same. like it is what it is and like you know in terms of even my students like I think about on the days when I'm critical about needing to take time what would I do if this was one of my students and of course it would be oh I'd be totally understanding right exactly it's hard yeah. it's hard to look at yourself in the mirror and 
I think that's what's so great about professors and teachers in that way is, um, you know, we all remember those professors and or teachers that changed our lives. And we all do. We keep them in our pocket. They're with us every day um, in some way. And I think we also remember those same teachers, right, showed us moments when they were human, Yeah. showed us moments where it was like, oh, we're not so different. There, There's a lot in common we have, right? And students will remember that chance you gave them, that moment you said, hey, take a rest, that moment that they said, oh, it's okay, turn it in when you can turn it in, for example, right? And as easy as it is, I'm sure for you to be like, tell your students that you're right. It is just as hard to tell yourself that mm-hmm. and to control your own monster in there. Um, it's it's hard. Mm-hmm. Possession is real. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard. And you can feel like a totally different person and a person that is completely out of control. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm. I'm so I'm. I'm sure your students love you. I have no question about that. I'm positive of it. And I think it reflects so much in in how how you speak about the importance of well-being um, and and looking out for yourself um, because that's so hard. And I I extra love that you found that journey through um, monsters, (laughs) you know? Absolutely. Um, in a way, I think like horror, even when I was going through very hard times, um, horror was very cathartic for me. It was, it was, it was great to just kind of like, and I think for me, when I was going through those very difficult times when I was younger, um, and being a survivor myself, like, like to, when I was going through it to where myself, I wasn't really able to feel, I felt very numb because I didn't know how to process what was going on since I was a kid, um, to watch those monsters and to kind of like have those kind of surrogate feelings because horror movies are so filled with emotion. Um, and so for me, it, it was very therapeutic to watch that. And I never really get scared, scared by a movie Um, just because for me, I guess like the monsters, like true monsters are the ones in real life. Um, I can deal with a fictional monster. No, Listen. Uh-huh. Um, but real monsters, they they're their own. They're they're truly the ones that are fear that people can fear. Well, once again, I'm so sorry for the things that you've experienced. And- oh, oh no, thank you. I I appreciate it. And you know, I I bring I bring them up because again, for me, um, I'm at a place in my life and professionally where I I do feel very serious about visibility, um, mm-hmm. because these things do not get talked about enough. So if I can in some way bring light to them, then that that brings me so much fulfillment. Well, I mean, it's so, again, similarly to the, you know, earlier experiences we were talking about, it should have never happened, right? Like those things should never happen ever. And I don't even want to say what I'm about to say is beautiful because it was hard and it is hard and it's a journey, but what is beautiful is, is the, is the writings that you make out of it is, is the, the art that you create is, is the hope that you give to others that have walked that same path, forcibly walked that same path. And I think it is so brilliant that you're exploring these things, um, with such courage. And what I mean by courage, right. I, I, I'm sure it was hard. I'm sure I'm sure writing about about these these specific monsters was very hard. And I think it's really powerful that you were like, "Hell yeah, here's this book. Yeah. Here is this freaking book right here." Okay? And this is how us, you know, individuals um can be powerful and can be strange and freaky and weird and monstrous and all of the things in the world, but we're hella powerful. We're so strong and we instill fear ourselves because we are so strong and assured of ourselves, you know? And I, I can only imagine that journey, but I'm 
I'm so happy that you're in this space now, existing now with your with your family, right? With your fur babies, with with your partner, with your husband, right? Like that that's that's beautiful. That's incredible. Thank you. I I really truly appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. It's amazing. No, what you're doing is amazing. And I want you to know that (laughs) even even if the monster in your head is like not (laughs) it's hard sometimes I think I think it's important and and as you said visibility is is so important I think um you know a lot of us wouldn't have even recognized the difficulties or or what have you without seeing other people experience it without seeing other people talk about it right whether that's um you know, in, in nonfiction format or in a, in a scary story, um, seeing those characters that we can identify with is so vital. People don't understand how necessary that is. And that's why weirdos like us fangirl over horror. That's why exactly. weirdos like us fangirled over Twilight for so long, exactly. right? Like that's, that's just, that's just what it is for many of us. It's all we have. And so keep writing Lauren keep thank writing you. and exploring and and doing it because so many people are so thankful for what you're doing thank you, know? thank you. and keep podcasting <laughs> that's the I mean if I can learn how to Zencaster properly I mean maybe maybe that would help um <laughs> technology is a fickle god I sure is speaking speaking of finicky little monsters uh, <laughs> that is technology for you um, gosh, but you know, and and speaking of these characters that we fall in love in love with, I know you mentioned so many that you wrote about, that you've explored, that you love. Um, what what are your top? I know this is a hard question. I know this is a very hard question. But what are your top films or books or series mm-hmm. or whatever um, oh. involving involving not only like possession and demons and monsters in the mind, but specifically with like motherhood. And, and that form of possession. Oh, that's a tough one. I know. <laughs> um, the Babadook um, I mentioned is yes. definitely one of my favorites. Um, in terms of horror TV, there's a lot. Um, in terms of what I watch, what I'm currently watching, um, yes. in terms of that... I have to think about this. Uh, to um, take your time. It's a big question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think for me, like, I actually, a, re- a film I watched um, a few months back, and I do apologize um, if I mispronounce the name of the film. Um, it's The Bone Woman or, um, <gasps> yeah. I've heard about this. Kutera. I've heard about this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. I have not seen it. I people have been telling me about it though, oh, and that I need so to. So good. It's ah. so good. Um, I was really fascinated with that. Um, and also too, in terms of also to other motherhood um, issues, um, child's play is a great one where there is <sighs> like again possession of an inanimate object. Um, I think child's Ooh. play says so much about not only at the time, like single mothers, um, but especially to like, like single mothers that are portrayed as being lower income and just even the guilt. Um, yeah. And so I would say those um, in terms of horror TV, I watch evil is really interesting. That show. Um, yeah. I, I really like it. And one of the main characters, she has four daughters and it's, it's just even too, like, it's really interesting to see her character develop. Um, yeah. And like they they, they deal with like demons and demonology in that show. Um, and in terms of, I think, Again, I'm more of a film person, so I'm kind of drawing from. Sure, yes. Uh, I'm drawing from film. Please, please. Um, of course, there's also to the classic um, Alfred Hitchcock Psycho, um, oh. where it's just like the the idea the mother really possesses, um, and then the yeah. TV series was also really good as well. Um, I never saw it. I did hear good things. Yeah, it was it was really well done, um, 
And also too, like in other forms of horror TV and possession, um, I'm a fan of like American Horror Story and then also American mm-hmm. Horror Stories. Um, mm-hmm. And they've they've explored motherhood and possession, like with Murder House um, yes. and certainly that season um but also too in terms of possession and asylum that's explored um hotel not as much um but yeah i i those are some that i hold dear to my heart Mm -hmm. um and then other films too, just ones also too I, I've watched, but also I'm currently writing on for for my next book, um, Gothica. Ah, next book. Yeah, <laughs> Gothica, which which doesn't so much has have motherhood, but it deals a lot with mental illness and possession. Um, yeah, it's so I'm I'm excited. Uh, what what a wonderful plethora of work. Um, Gosh, how how fascinating. And I think it, it really is, as you're saying these things, right, I it's funny because some of the films you've mentioned that I never really thought of, oh yeah, like possession. Yeah. Right? Like, and it's it's weird to see the different contexts um that that word can take on. Um, like child's play, for example, I well, I could never handle it as a kid. I was so scared. Of, I'm still a little scared of of child's play. Like, are you kidding? Like Ooh, it for some reason just picked on something deep down that that was really frightening but I had never thought about it as like oh yeah duh and the single mother concept and oh oh my gosh yes oh I, and I need to see bone woman I need yeah, to see bone it's woman so yesterday. good it's so good it's so good and then also birth rebirth was also really interesting it was kind of like yeah it was kind of like a a franken like a remaking of like like frankenstein um involving like the the biological mother of this girl um who has passed and then the doctor who kind of revives her and is taking care of her um and like how they create their own family it's interesting um but yeah, I, I do. I, I love, and for me, child's play. Um, I love Chucky as a character. I think he's so funny. Like speaking of funny, right? Yeah. Speaking of funny. <laughs> like he's very funny. And like the new Chucky series just like, is totally, they, is they it? put like, they, they basically like, they've just gone deeper and deeper into the like realm of, okay, I guess we're doing this now. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. Like the, yeah. that's what, what possession is. That's what the, this concept, this creature, this right, whatever. It's this unhinged nature yeah. that you don't know where it's going to go next. That's the point. Right. Yeah. And, and I think we're, we're pretty fascinated with like possessed items and, and, or like cursed items. Um, you know, there's the Annabelle doll and Ooh, yeah. just even two people who like, and I've seen them on like TikTok, other social medias where like, they like to collect like, like, like haunted items or whatnot, or they like to actively seek out. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's interesting to see that fascination with kind of the inanimate becoming like almost being possessed with life right this idea of the adverse um would you ever is it the lorraine's basement or the 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 special room oh the warren's basement yes warren's that's that's what it is the warren's that has like all of like the most quote-unquote possessed objects like in american history would you ever visit something like that um sure i mean for you're so brave (laughs) i'm like sure like even too like the you know the when you see like ghost adventures like spend a night here i'm like sure i'd do that like if they you know if they had like if i had some creature comforts i'd be fine yeah (laughs) like that's you are a brave soul a very brave soul Thank you. And like even to the the hotel where my husband and I got married, the Hawthorne Hotel in Salem is said to be haunted. And so you guys are so cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've also always loved that. Like I was watching yes. like, you know, the scariest places on earth and like those type of shows growing up. Yes. And oh, of course. Love to learn the history of them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I 
sure why not like yeah. and even like oh, the conjuring yeah. house it's like sure that's right you can stay there now right you can yes um which i like for me i have like mixed emotions about like the very popularized places like sure. into like like um lizzie borden is now like a hotel i think like right. Um, yeah, say at the conjuring house. Cause I do, I do believe in, in ghosts and spirits, but I do believe also too, like in needing to respect mm -hmm. them as well. And, um, I'm not such a fan of like actively trying to annoy or irritate them. Cause like, I mean, that's just like normal human people. Like I don't want to annoy or irritate people. Oh yeah. Listen, Lauren, the commercialization of hauntings and haunted oh houses God. and haunted places could be an entirely different podcast. So if you ever want to do one down the line, I, you let I'd me know. I'd be happy to. Right. Like if you think about, oh, there's oh, there's this really great um, podcast episode that I was introduced to by another friend who loves spooky stuff. Um, and I will link it in the description um, that it, it's it's an explore. This specific episode is an exploration into that very idea, but more specifically um, into how a lot of um, slavery plantations have become sites, right, for people to stay and be haunted and X, Y, Z. And that idea of privilege and that idea of how even after death, right their narratives are still being stripped from them stripped from their mouths stripped from their identities and their autonomy is gone um so whew, yeah that could that could be a whole other show <laughs> oh i i absolutely agree and and even too it does have ties to like true crime um in terms of you know we're fascinated by the actual atrocity that happens but do we right. really remember that like these are actual individuals involved who were tortured and enslaved right. and lost their lives and um and what right. i do find when i like look at the kind of like especially television episodes um a lot of times especially in those like mansions um a lot of times i feel like they kind of um they kind of like water down the slavery mm -hmm. aspect, especially in the South with mansions. Yes. And instead, of, instead they're just like, oh, look at this, that it might be haunted by, yeah. you know, a woman. And like, it, and so I do find, I do find it fascinating. Oh yeah. Oh, it's so, it's haunting in and of itself <laughs> yeah. in its own way. Man, we should write a joke book too. Uh, <laughs> at this right. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, Lauren, last few questions. Unfortunately, again, we could talk about this all day. I but... know. <laughs> <laughs> why, in in your best way possible, right? Why why have monsters in the mind been of such fascination for you? Why are they so important and so necessary to you today? So I think that they are um, because in terms of like, like even to like as as means of discussing and exploring the things that a lot of times we're not I'm not able to vocalize um, really and then to be able to have that access point, whether it's a film or a TV show or a book is so important um, mm -hmm. in terms of really being able to get that foothold into talking about um, these deeper issues. Um, and I think monsters of the mind also too are important in terms of thinking about our own society and culture, um, exploring like what are they rebelling against um, and being able to come to terms with also too like things that have that things that do influence identity um and also in my own identity and being able to essentially rework and reprogram um those monsters um because i think a lot of times in you know when we talk about the real life repercussions of monsters of the mind when we think about like mental health for instance i think a lot of times our instinct is to try to fight against it 
or or push against it. And for myself, I found um, that's not really helpful and that's not really a way to, to grow. Um, I think that there is this struggle to embrace our own monsters in our own minds um, and what those look like um, because it does. It, it then, just like possession, it, it really reshapes who you are and how you go about life. Um, I think on a, on a wider scale, um, I think it's so important. We think about monsters of the mind in this moment to really think about, um, our own lives, but also to the lives that of people who came before us and what we want the future to really, to be able to, what we hope the future to have. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Thank and you. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. I feel the same way. Thank <laughs> I feel you. the same way. Well, I know it's a silly question because the name is in the name, but <laughs> do you think that monsters in the mind slash demons, right? Are monsters. And that's an interesting question because it then goes to the other question, like what is a monster? Right, um, which is a very important question. And we got so far into it, didn't even ask you that. So it, it's okay. I'm I, I thought about it coming into this interview. I'm like, I thought about it. Um, I really think monster is a really complicated, complex term. Um, and I think that like, on the one hand, when we think about like monsters, we have some monsters who really are more human than monster, um, but are still classified as monsters. Um, we also too then have like this idea of monsters in the very classical sense, the demons, um, the, the entities that are working to hurt us. And I think that, whether or not they work to hurt us, I think a monster is something or someone that at the very least presents the threat of hurt or harm coming mm -hmm. to us. Um, and then not to draw on like Cohen's monster theory, for instance, yeah. in, in like <laughs> seven theses, but um, where he, he also says like, you know, they're hard, hard, they're harbinger. They're also too, they exist outside of boundaries. Um, I think they, they both exist outside and within boundaries because like in order, cause they are kind of in existing, they, they also define what the boundaries are. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would say a monster monster is really something or someone, like I said, that at the very least presents as a threat. And it can be for yeah, a variety of reasons. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like that, that's, you know, it's that inherent uh, jump scare, right? It's yeah. that inherent fear. Something's off. Something's not right, quote unquote. And I love how you said even not existing in boundaries is a creation of a boundary <laughs> as well, right? Like, and I think that's what's so great about monsters is they're always, um, turning themselves on their heads, right? Like their, their definition, their concepts, their identities, right? They are different for everybody, but they instill very similar feelings for everybody, um, which is, it's just so crazy cool. It is so cool. So do you think monsters in the mind are monsters? Ooh, I think I would say yes, because even to, even if they're not demons, even if we think of like, um, like maternal guilt or like that is still considered a monster because like, if we start to feel guilty, we're, we're threatening our own kind of, um, inner stability in a way, if we feel like we've done something wrong. Um, and I think also too, like, um, I think, you know, again, even if we think about like, um, mental health, like monsters in the mind can threaten to, again, like throw us into this chaotic state where all of a sudden we're forced to, to at, at the very least acknowledge things that we had tried to repress to, or hadn't thought about in perhaps years. Um, and so I think, I, I do think that monsters in the mind, um, they are a threat. They, they are something, um, 
But I think Monsters in the Mind, just like even to the classic possession, possessed body, um, I think that they're able to, um, if not be expelled from us, to coexist. Mm. And... And again, I'll, I'll reference the Babadook, the ending. I oh. think it's such an important ending where, like, the monster is not out of the house and gone. Like, it's in the basement. And she has to face it ev- and feed it every single day. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's such, like, a telling interpretation of trauma of, of whatever monsters we have inside of us. It's so profound. It's so profound. And I think we all have, and in your case, monsters in the attic, maybe (laughs) since they're up here, Um, but a version um, in that way. And you have to kind of learn to coexist. Um, And monsters can mean so many different things, so many different things. Okay, Lauren. So last question. Now, maybe, right. It's just like, say it's just a Saturday night, right. And you're just chilling with your husband, maybe, I don't know, Twinkie, Ginger, <laughs> the cat, Herbie, maybe they're all there, right? You guys are watching something scary. I don't know, just chilling, vibing, all the good things. All of a sudden, see now, I don't know if it's a knock on the door or something else, but you realize you're face to face with your own monster in the mind, right? In in physical form, right? What would you do in a situation like that? How would you react? Would you say anything? What would you say if you did? um we'd probably be well acquainted (laughs) you're Um, like i talk to them every day what do you mean (laughs) to be like do you want anything to eat or drink um (laughs) if it was like a monster trying to come to my house as if like or even to like a stranger or something um one thing i didn't say when introducing where i live so i live in like it's it's on a main road but it's very woodsy like Mm -hmm. most people pass like the entrance to my drive and like like to go down the drive there's just like these like tall pine trees and like brush on either side and um we have this like huge bush in front of our front door so you don't even see like the openness um and we have what i refer to as a murder shed um, (laughs) which is like this like very old starting to fall apart wooden shed um And, like, I do feel like, you know, and I've joked to my husband that, like, you know, when we see someone even coming to drop off, like, a package late at night, we get, like, on alert. And I and I joke, they probably are freaked out by whoever lives there. Like, and, you know, we, it's very dark. Like, we even have, like, a street light, like, on our property just to, like, illuminate the front yard. And. Right. Yeah. So, so. (laughs) This episode of Floaties for Krakens was written and recorded by me, Camille Maria Costa. A monster's thank you to Lauren Rocha for such a heartfelt interview. A big thank you to Michael Kosman for producing a stellar episode, and a huge thank you to Natalie Hedberg for designing such a phenomenal logo. And music for the show is also written and produced by me, with a special appearance by my tata, Toby Acosta. Thank you all so much for tuning into today's show. It truly means everything to me. If you have questions or curiosities about the research or media referenced in today's episode, everything will hopefully be in the description box. And you can find us on our website and our socials. Links in the description as well. Anyway, thanks again for being here, everyone. Just a little reminder. It's okay to be afraid of the monster, but it's also okay to love the heck out of it, too. Keep being monstrous and keep shining bright.